Hello friends, my name is Roisin and welcome back to my channel. So a year ago I put up a video about my 10 favourite literary fiction books of all time, which I will leave in the cards above if you'd like to go and check that one out. But looking back at it I noticed that it didn't include very many books that I have read since I started my channel. And so since I've been reading so much more these past two years I thought it would be great to do a little update um, and give you 10 more literary fiction that I love. I do still love all of the books that I talked about in that video but I didn't want to repeat myself so these aren't necessarily my top 10 of all time altogether but they are 10 new literary fiction books that I love and when I say new I mean new to me. Um, some of these did come out in the past couple of years but most of them are a little bit older than that. But first of all I just wanted to, to have a talk a little bit about literary fiction and what I mean when I say that because it is such a nebulous term um, which can often just mean you know pretentious fiction or people who want to be snooty about um, genre or commercial fiction um, but I think it's a it's it almost seems to be a genre that is defined against rather than um, defined specifically by itself um, it is not commercial and not genre when I say literary fiction what I generally speaking mean is that it is a book that does that it is a book that does more than tell a story. It is a book that explores themes and ideas and that uses language and characterization to do so. It, they are often books that play with form um, and books that and where the plot kind of isn't forward. Some of these are quite plotty books but they are not books that are just about telling a story. They are books that are trying to do something different or novel or deep with the form of the novel. And there are also books that I think meet their readers halfway and expect you to do a little bit of work with the book. They aren't books that just lay out a story for you, they are books that invite you to think and give you um, things to ruminate on. But without further ado let's get into these 10 literary fiction books that I love. The first one I have on my list is very predictable considering um, that I am a white millennial woman with an Irish background um, and that is Normal People by Sally Rooney. This book has been a publishing sensation, it has been adapted into a TV series, so it definitely walks the line between commercial and literary fiction. This tells the story of Connell and Marianne who are a couple of young people growing up in Ireland around the time of the financial crash 2007-2008 from a small town near Sligo and Marianne is well off but is unpopular and Connell is from a working class background but is very popular at school. When they both go off to Trinity College Dublin their social status flips because of the emphasis on class. This book explores themes of communication, of mental health and of cycles of trauma and abuse and how those things can constrict the way we feel able to express ourselves. It's a book about identity as much as it is about relationships and I think that Whilst it has been a fairly polarising book there are a lot of people who don't like it. In fact I read it for a book club with two of my friends and whilst two of us really loved this book one didn't like it at all. It's a very slow moving book where there's not a lot that happens um, which I think can be off-putting for some people but I think the beauty of this book is in the deep way that it engages with the psychology of its characters um, both through their mental health and just through the, the way that the strictures of society that make them feel unable to communicate or to be themselves and put them into positions that they find uncomfortable as a form of coping. There are a lot of difficult things in this book including um, abuse, sexual abuse and eating disorders um, which can be quite triggering for some people so if that is you I would warn you against, I would warn you before you go into this book but on the whole I think it is so slow and quiet but with such a power underlying that. It's a very beautifully written book and one where it and one where Rooney uses the style the form and of the writing in order to portray the characters for example the the perspective flips between Connell and Marianne throughout and it does so sometimes even within one sentence which I can see could be confusing but at the same time it allows them to display their connectedness their similarity their places where they meet whilst they are still struggling to communicate the next one on my list is also a fairly popular book but one that I definitely think deserves the hype that it's got and that is Sing Unburied Sing by Jessamine Ward. 
This book is set in, I think, in Louisiana, in the Deep South in America, about Jojo and his mother, Leonie, who are traveling to the prison nearby where his father is incarcerated. Leonie is black and Jojo's father is white. When they arrive at the prison, there is something that is slightly magical and unreal. There are the ghosts of the past that haunt this prison. And part of the past of the prison is that Jojo's grandfather and Leonie's father, Rivers, was incarcerated there in the 1960s. So we see, we explore both the present moment of this road trip um, and of the relationships between Leonie and Jojo and Jojo's little sister as well. Um, and Leonie who is struggling with a drug addiction. Um, and we also see the 1960s, I believe, when Rivers was incarcerated. We see his past and we see the incarceration system as the an extension of slavery as Rivers is out in fields picking cotton. This book uh, weaves so many themes in so well, cycles of abuse again and cycles of trauma and how those things perpetuate, how poverty perpetuates, uh, how the incarceration system criminalises black people and the violence against black people for the colour of their skin, for example, um, through the through the characters of Leonie's brother who haunts her. Um, this book is a lot about hauntings and the things that stay with us from the past. It's so incredibly beautifully written. It flips again between perspectives. Um, Jojo's relationship with his sister is so incredibly touching and moving, whilst at the same time, um, Jasmine Ward manages to keep forefront in her mind that he is a child looking after this baby and the way that this tender relationship mirrors the tender relationship of um, Leonie and her brother and the tra trauma that comes from that situation. The ghosts are woven in so seamlessly, the magic realist elements of this book, to add a level of dreamlike quality, of unbelievability to the horrors that happen, because whilst the horrors are real and very realistic, the fact that they happen is almost unbelievable. Um, there are many examples of violence committed against people just for being black um, through police road stops and through lynchings. Um, it's a, a difficult book. I definitely cried finishing this book, um, but one that is so beautifully written and with such complex, interesting characters that you can see the perspective of all of them. Number three is The Old Drift by Namwali Sapel, and this is an epic book. This is one of the books on my list that is actually quite plotty. It starts in 1904 with The Old Drift, which is a hotel in rural Zambia. This bit is written as a colonialist um, diary entry and is really, really well done that she, um, the way Sapel plays with form. Um, and the irony and humour that we can see, because it feels so much like the way that if you've read anything from that time period, any colonialist fiction, it's so perfectly pitched to that form. And at the same time, very funny because we can see the ignorances of this man and the um, arrogance at the same time. These men then all leave. Well, the, two of these men then leave Zambia and one is a native Zambian man. He stays there and has a family. And then we follow this three sections called the grandmothers, the mothers and the children. Um, so we follow a hundred years of more than 100 years of Zambian history, although it is not actually direct history, it does break off into being a sort of parallel history, which ends up being in a slightly science fiction realm. Um, I think that science fiction realm is perfectly balanced because it continues the themes of the novel um, without going too out there. It's not like a deus ex machina strange ending, although it is very strange, um, but it is, it feels fitting within the novel and I'm not a science fiction reader. Um, I think this works. If you like people like Zadie Smith and Kazuo Ishiguro, I feel like this could work for you as well. Um, there are sections throughout told from the perspective of a a collective voice uh, like a Greek chorus as well um, added in and they are uh, almost again like prose poetry as I said with the Jasmine Ward. Um, these are sections with a lot of rhythm and rhyme that just split through the different perspectives. Sapel manages to tell us multiple different perspectives without any of them feeling too similar or too aligned. Um, everything, everyone has their own voice and you can really feel the time period as well, the way that Sapel is playing with, again, that colonialist fiction, um, the mid-century African classics, um, and then on into more modern future uh, futuristic fiction uh, or Afrofuturism and there is a lot of humour as well this book is really very funny it plays with irony that gives this book a touch of the Austonian um, it is very much a comedy of manners that is that's talking about the caste system in Zambia or in southern Africa generally it is talking about the um, 
it talks about colonialism and post-colonialism, the Marxist revolutions in Africa, and it uses conversation as a way to explore many different ideas, neo-colonialism and techno-colonialism coming in at the end. It is such a broad, expansive novel with so many ideas in it that I definitely think I will get something again out of it reading it the second time that I didn't get before um, but there is still whilst it is very much character driven and we are just following the characters there is a through line of plot which very much reminded me of Zadie Smith um, and also that lightness and that humour and that irony that make it for a big book a very very compelling read. Another book from Southern Africa that I have loved is, is House of Stone by Nivuo Rosa Tushuma. This one is set in Zimbabwe and it's about a man who is a lodger in his family's home. The son of the family have, has gone missing recently and the lodger knows something but he is not letting on. He uses his position to wheedle his way into this family and to hear about their secrets, what they got up to in, the, in Zimbabwe's history and this way explores the post-colonial history of Zimbabwe and Robert Mugabe's rise to power. It's a brutal book. There is a lot of very darkness in this book um, and it is again tinged with humour that feels surreal and off kilter. Our main character and narrator is uh, unreliable and slides himself into other people's perspectives in a way that makes it hard to know what is true and what is not and always keeps you on edge. There is a lot of violence in this book as you would expect from a book that is about both colonialism and a dictator's rise to power um, and a genocide. There are all of those things <laughs> to trigger warn you for um, but they are done in a way that feels not gratuitous in any way whilst it's still relentless um it's managing to balance the truth of it without ever feeling like um we are being what's the word i want voyeurs to pain it again manages to get through multiple perspectives and allow you to see things from to understand how people got to places that they did to the way that people survive the pain of colonialism and the pain of uh, this dictator's genocide um and again has a level of humour to it um, but I enjoy but you never feel comfortable whilst reading this book there is a tension throughout and there is a tension of not just not trusting the hands that you're in because they could take take you in any direction at any point um, it's really a read that I think engages you on so many levels and if you like to sink into a book to be comfortable this is definitely not the book for you because this is a book that will keep you constantly thinking and keep you constantly aware the writing itself i was stunned that this was a debut novel because the writing itself is so incredibly beautiful and um like i said that characterization is done just so well another one that i feel like walks the line between commercial and literary fiction and one that has been incredibly popular is the vanishing half by Britt bennett um, this is a book where the writing itself it is so deftly done because it feels so simple but at the same time is playing with a lot of layers. The Vanishing Half tells the story of twin sisters who um, grow up in a town of Motel which is a town of light-skinned black people who are very obsessed with colorism and with being light-skinned. These twins run away to New Orleans and end up being split up, one of whom uh, lit marries a dark-skinned black man and embraces that side of her and one of whom pretends to be white and marries a white man and um, moves into the world as if she were a white woman. This is set in the 50s and 60s and then we also follow the daughters of both of these women in the 70s, 80s, in the 80s and 90s and I think 2000s as well. They discover more about themselves, one of whom is a dark-skinned child and one of whom is white passing believes she is white um, and it is very much about identity. This book is about identity and explores identity and the and perception um so there is a character it does explore trans identity as well that is part of the novel and it is about perception and prejudice and how the way people and how the way people perceive you impacts on your view of the world uh, of course it is a book about colorism as you can tell from the very fact of the town of motel which is founded on co uh, colorism but also about what is whiteness and about the construction of race because does passing for white make you white if you can live as if you were white and how that shows that race is entirely societal and not natural through flicking between different time periods and flicking between different different perspectives it flicks between the way that it talks a lot about perception and the way we view and perceive each other and ourselves it talks again about the way that history impacts on our modern way of living and it and Britt Bennett creates characters that are so wonderfully whole and 
um, sympathetic despite the things that they do that are not good things things they do that they can be judged for we can still sympathize with them and understand where they were coming from we can see the fear that drives some of their lives or the love or the shame that has been in inflicted by cultural and familial conditioning it is such a lightly written book and occasionally veers into hitting things slightly too on the head for my personal taste but i can see why it has so much love throughout the world and i why it has had so much love throughout the past year and i think that it does very deftly handle so many different themes whilst being still eminently readable the book that i read a while ago but i have been talking about a lot on this channel is the shadow king by maza mengiste this is set in ethiopia during the italian invasion in the 1930s and the attempt to colonize ethiopia at this time, Haile Selassie flees to the UK. During the, the guerrilla war, uh, a woman dresses up a young peasant man as Haile Selassie and parades him through the towns to, in order to give the guerrilla's fighters more um, a, a morale boost. We follow that woman from her time as a slave in her household because, through to becoming a warrior woman um, and also being a prisoner. This book is very complicatedly written. I think that there is a lot, there are a lot of layers to it. The epigraph at the beginning is from the Iliad and that theme of Greek tragedy and of uh, raising these women warriors to the level of mythological heroes plays throughout. We have segments told from a Greek chorus of women, um, of, from the perspective of a Greek chorus of Ethiopian women, which is very, very powerful. There is also a lot of uh, imagery that is really beautifully evoked, imagery of the photograph, for example, for one of the Italian soldiers is a photographer and he phot photographs the atrocities committed by the Italian army. Um, and so the themes, these photographs are again vignettes that come, uh, reappear throughout, but also the themes of light and squares and shapes of light because the uh, Ethiopian guerrillas used light as part of their way to communicate during war. It talks about layers and difficulties again. It talks about perspectives and how whilst the Ethiopian men are the guerrilla army fighting off an invading force of colonialists, they are also, there is also a gender imbalance and the violence committed against women against the Ethiopian women by Ethiopian men is also explored. Also Ettore, this photographer who is a um, who is part of the Italian army, part of the invading, invading colonial army, is also Jewish and he knows that his parents have been taken away by the Mussolini's regime um, and the threat of that hangs over him. So he is complicit in the atrocities but also under duress because of the um, regime in his own home country. It's a book that lightly and deftly handles so many different themes and whilst written in a way that takes a little time to get into, I feel like really beautifully evokes the um, the landscape of Ethiopia and the different layers of the themes that um, Mengiste is exploring. The fourth African book to make it on this list is Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga, which is the first in the trilogy. Um, the final one in the trilogy, This Mournable Body, uh, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize last year, along with The Shadow King by Maza Mengiste. But this first book in the trilogy talks about childhood in Zimbabwe when it was Rhodesia. It is auto-fiction based very strongly on Tsitsi Dangaremka's own experience and it talks about how she could not get, an, it talks about how the main character could not get an education until her brother died. Um, this is the first line of the book, I'm not spoiling anything, we know that her brother is dead from the outset, um, but because there was, had to be funding for schools she, her and her family did not have enough money to send her until her brother died and then it was deemed she, need, she needed to get an education. It talks a lot about gender in Zimbabwe and the different cultural layers of uh, power throughout Zimbabwe. It's a very, very close portrait of this girl, um, and but but through her eyes and through her perspective, we see the we see the society in colonial Zimbabwe, and we also see also see her culture because she travels to the city, um, but is also living in a compound of in her father's compound. Um, and she also goes to a mission school, which is a Christian school with nuns, I think. I believe there are nuns in the school, as far as I remember. Um, this, this one is so much more plainly written than some of the others, but I think it works really, really well for it being from a child's perspective. It is one that has so many layers. For example, the 
main character has dealt with hunger and with famine in the past and but she when she goes to the school she lives with her cousin who is starving herself because of the limits of being a woman uh, in both Zim Zimbabwe society and also in, in colonial society of being a black woman of being deemed lesser and of being constricted her father's is very much the patriarch of the house and the constriction is really something that you can feel really strongly as a theme throughout the novel the, the strict line that um both the main character and her cousin have to walk um in order and the only rebellion that they ca are able to give this this novel also explores ideas of cultural imperialism and of the right way of doing things being the way of the British minority rule and that is another of the strictures that Tambudzai, the main character, fights against. Hello, editing regime here because I realised I'd forgotten to talk about one of the books on my list so this is only going to be a nine books video if I didn't come back and talk to you. Um, so the one I forgot was Till by Daniel Kellman and it was on my list which I was looking at, I just skipped over it. Till by Daniel Kellman is a piece of historical fiction which you know if you watch this channel that I love um, but the reason I wanted to include this in literary fiction is because I think of the skill the writer has with form and with language. This is set in Germany in the 17th century during the Thirty Years' War and it takes Till, who is a trickster character from uh, German mythology, and sets him in this historical time period. We see part of his youth in a small village in um, Bohemia, I think, as the lower class son of a miller who ends up involved in a witch trial. We see him on the run and becoming a circus performer. We see him as a jester in the in the court of the Winter King, a king who was only crowned for three months before he was deposed, but who still acts as if he is king, taking his increasingly impoverished court around uh, Central Europe. We also see him as a soldier beneath a besieged castle, completely in the dark with a, n a number of soldiers who don't know if he can trust, and we see from the perspective of Elizabeth Stuart as well as as well as one of the counts, showing us different perspectives on this Thirty Years' War. This book is told entirely non-linearly um, and jumps about from place to place in a way that creates the confusion that is part of this historical time period where nobody knows who anybody is on the side of, nobody knows what is going on, um, and because of a mini ice age alongside this war there is a famine at the same time. People are starving and people are desperate. This is an incredibly dark book. There is a lot of violence and a lot of, there is a lot of violence as well as a lot of really dark like folklore um, superstition elements particularly in the beginning and through the woods the woods are often for, um, often shown as this place of darkness where terrible things can happen and what whether that is magical and witchcraft as is a big force in this book or if that is the evil that humans can commit against one another um, especially during times of famine and war in a similar way to house of stone this book has a lot of humor but it is humor that always feels slightly unhinged and on edge i feel like this book is incredibly incredibly tense despite being kind of magical and folklore elements it almost feels like a historical thriller in a way there's a lot of violence to it not that there's a specific crime we're looking for but there is just a sense that something terrible is around every corner which keeps a lot of tension in the reader if you like historical fiction for the, its ability to envelop you in the time period i think this one would really work well because while there is not a lot of like description of what happens at court or anything like that there is just this feeling of a superstition and of a, a not knowing and of the fear that that invokes of subsistence living hand to mouth is also a really strong feeling in this book um, and as well as that there's a lot of dark humour and irony among the of the ridiculousness of the court system and of this guy who's king for three months and of what you can do or say as a king. It's not actually a very long book but there is so much packed in there that I think it's one of those really thick dense books that you can really sink your teeth into if that is something that you enjoy and I think is one that lovers of Gormenghast or Hilary Mantel or anything dark and twisty would really really enjoy. Number nine on my list is Swimming in the Dark by Tomasz Jardowski, another very slow close portrait um, that says a lot of things. This book is set in Poland in the 1970s, 1980s, somewhere around there, about two boys Ludwig and Janusz who first meet at a summer camp um, because 
this is Poland under communism. All of the university students are required to go and work in a farm for a summer before they can graduate. And that is where they meet uh, and fall in love. Our main character is reading Giovanni's room and is discovering himself and his sexuality through books when he first arrives. Um, and these two boys explore spend the summer exploring each other and themselves um, and go off camping after the time at the at the camp itself is finished um, get to know one another but then when they move back to Warsaw they they continue their relationship which is illegal at the time um, but both go down different paths one who is uh, from a more bourgeois um, city family uh, who has experienced the loss of for example a Jewish friend in childhood um, to the regime who begins to question it and to get involved in resistance work and the other who is a rural boy who believes very very much in the party and thinks that the party will protect them um, and we see the way that they both struggle with identity and with the, the society in which they live and the ways that they can survive there. This book has a very slow moving almost dream like feel to it. We flash backwards and forwards between this time when um, there has been revolution in Poland um, and also back into when the pre-revolutionary times when these two boys were first meeting and working their way through to be with each other in this society. This book gives no question about what is the right thing to do or what is the right way to be. It doesn't give any glory to any any perspective which I think is really refreshing in a book that talks about communism. Um, because obviously the regime in Poland is a very difficult one but that doesn't mean that freedom is found when you leave and I think that that is one of the perspectives that is very much explored in this novel. It is a book that I think is deceptively quiet um, but has a lot to say. And then the final book I would like to recommend is Mr. Loverman by Bernadine Evaristo. Now obviously this is a very well-known book on booktube um, and Obviously Bernadine Evaristo is very, very well known for winning the booker with Girl, Woman, Other. I didn't 100% get on with Girl, Woman, Other and I much prefer Mr Loverman, which is told from the perspective of Barrington, a man from Antigua who has moved to the UK as part of the Windrush generation um, and raised a family and has raised a family there. Um, but at the same time, since he was 14, he has been in a relationship with his best friend, Morris. Um, and they have been together and whilst they have been together the whole time he uh, Barrington has been in the closet and are also and married to um, a woman we hear things from the perspective of Barrington in modern in 2010s London um, talking about his children and his grandchildren uh, and his wife we also see things from the perspective of his wife back in Antigua when they first got married um, and it allows us to see both sides of these people and the situation in which they have found themselves. Barrington is a misogynist and Barrington isn't a perfect person at all but he's also so warm, so charming and I think that there is a lot of humour to this book. Um, Bernadine Evaristo does a really great job of whilst telling things from the perspective of this raconteur who knows how to charm people we still also always see his flaws. We always, we have no illusions about the type of person that Barrington is and yet he, I feel like he can still charm you um, and I think that having the perspective of Constance back in Antigua when she was young we see how she turned into the person that she is at the end um, the trauma of childbearing for her and the difficulties of her life and the way that she found safety um, and the way that she found herself when she was in a marriage with a man who did not offer her safety and security in himself. We see the fear and the shame that have kept Barrington in the way that he is despite the lightness and the humour of his tone and we see the love that he really does have for his family again despite his gentle mocking of them. It's a book again that seems deceptively simple which I think is a lot of the power of contemporary literary fiction. It can seem like there is like it's not saying much, like there's no plot going on and not a lot happens, but feel the ideas that are being explored, the idea of shame and of fear that and the way that it can constrict people's lives and cause them to turn into people that they don't really like. Um, Barrington at the start of this novel has decided that it is time finally to come out to his family and the exploration of his difficulty in doing that, his um, use of antagonistic humour as a defence mechanism. I think he is such a perfectly drawn character. He feels really 100% real to me, as do a lot of the characters in this book, and I think that that is the strength of it. 
So those are 10 literary fiction books that I have loved since I started my channel. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these and what you thought of them. I know I have definitely recommended them several times in various different videos but I thought it would be good to get them all together. And let me know what your favourite literary fiction books that you've read in the past two years are. I would love to hear from you in the comments. If you did enjoy this video I will leave another top 10 list here for you to go and check out some more recommendations if you possibly need any and if you aren't subscribed I'll leave a button here where you can subscribe as well. I would love it if you could join us. I put out new videos three times a week and so I will see you again very soon. Thank you for watching. Bye bye!